Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the other side of weight loss podcast. I'm excited for my guest today. It's somebody I've learned a lot from already, and I listen to her often on podcasts, so I knew I had to get her in on mine. Her name is Dr. Rita Marie Los. I'm going to say this wrong. Los Calzo. Los Calzo. You're Los Calzo. Calzo. Okay, Los Calzo. Okay, okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll blame it on the Canadian accent. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dr. Rita Marie is a licensed doctor of chiropractic with certification in acupuncture and is a diplomat of the American Clinical Nutrition Board. She is a certified clinical nutritionist with a master's degree in human nutrition and has completed a 500-hour herbal medicine certification program. So hardly anything. <laughs> She's the founder of the Institute of Nutritional Endocrinology and is the author of the book, The Unstoppable Health. Dr. Rita Marie specializes in using the wisdom of nature married with modern scientific research to restore balance to hormones with a special emphasis on thyroid, adrenal, and insulin imbalances. So welcome, Dr. Rita Marie. Well, thank you for having me here. I'm Yay. Excited. Yes, I'm excited too. I love listening to you speak. I listen to all your podcasts and you're just, I, everything that you have to say and I just think it's so great. It's like, oh, so many women need to hear your standpoint on hormones and just that how we can fix them through our nutrition, which I think is so important. We always tend to go straight for the drugs and the supplements and when we can get it from our food, right? Right, right. Yeah. Food and, you know, some of the special foods that nature has provided as well. But I think, you know, it's interesting because I talk about hormones being the master of everything. They control yeah. everything, right? Our metabolic rate, our, our fear responses, our... Uh, reproductive function or immune system. I mean, there's a hormone for everything. And what we don't realize is that all of the choices we make every single day control our hormones. And that's the thing I want women to, and men to realize as well. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then it's not just, there's not, it's not just food. There's so many things that impact our hormones, isn't there? That's right. Yes. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like what exactly, how are we getting so affected hormonally? Because it just feels like we're all feeling the effects of hormonal imbalance right now. Everybody's feeling a hormone imbalance yeah. because number one, our, our environment, look at the environment we live in. There's, there's the endocrine disruptors, all the different chemicals. Have, so many of them have been discovered to be endocrine disruptors. They actually disrupt and they actually bind to the receptors in the body for a particular hormone and fake the body into thinking, oh, we have plenty of that hormone, when in reality it can't do the job or it can do some bad things, you know, cause proliferation of breast tissue, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got that. The food supply, look around what most people eat. I'm always just flabbergasted when I travel and I see that people actually eat this stuff that comes out of packages and you can't even pronounce half the words, right? So nobody's eating, not nobody, but people as a rule are not eating real whole fresh foods. They're missing that. So in addition to not having all the nutrients that are in those whole fresh foods, they have all the toxins that are in those processed foods and those get in the way of hormone function. And then we have stress. Let's just talk about mental, emotional stress, right? Yeah. I, it's 24 seven. It's not just like, oh, there's a tiger. I better run away. Oh, good. I'm good. Let's go have sex. You know, yeah. it, it, it's not like that anymore. It's really this is 24 seven, whether it's your kids, your parents, the bank, the economy, the environment, you don't like, you know, whoever's the lights, in right? Like I always see people going, like, just the artificial lighting, the artificial that's a stress. lighting alone, yes. right? And, and the cell phones, which we all love and have, but the, the environmental stress that that puts out there, the carpeting, the paint, all the, the materials that we're using. I'm fortunate, you know, my house is 20 something, 27 years old or so, and I haven't repainted it except for one room that we did like six or seven years ago, and it's all like the no VOC paint, so it didn't even smell at the time. But I'm afraid to have to go in and start to deal with all the other places, right? Because you have to get the special paints and you have to do a special job. We tore out all of our carpets years ago. My kid, my youngest son was about three at the time and he was waking up every morning with post-nasal drip. And the weird thing was he'd go off and he'd play and it would go away and then always in the morning. So we started to suspect, I got some mold plates I tested and sure enough, there was some mold in there. We tore out all the carpets 
the carpeting, the under thing in the carpet. Oh my God, we had to leave the house. Fortunately, it wasn't so horrific that we had to get rid of all our belongings, but we had to get rid of, um, get out of the house, get rid of all that and replace the whole house with bamboo. As soon as that happened, he never woke up with post-nasal drip again. Wow. So all of these things, and that's yeah. you know, not, not related to hormones, but it is related to it hormones. Is, yeah. It's all disrupting how our hormones run. Yeah. And, you know, the, so the environment is what you brought off noise, even right. The constant yeah. barragement where the news is on and where even if you're not paying attention to it, it's there and you're hearing this negative stuff and we, we just can't cope with it. And our hormones get whacked out. Big oh. time. I remember listening to, I think it was Dr. Kalish, I think I want to say this was years ago. And he was talking about hormones. And I remember him saying, if you eat well, and you know, you don't drink, you're not eating the sugars, you're not eating processed right. foods, and you still are suffering with hormone imbalance, then you must look to chronic infections, like whether that be oh, yeah. old or the heavy metals or what. And I was like, exactly. it was like a light bulb went off. I'm like, it was the first time someone had said that where it was like, okay, like, I'm not, it's not because I'm not a hundred percent perfect all the time with my diet, you know, no, and it was like, more I have than to- that, right. It's yeah. way more than that. And when you are eating right and you are using the non VOC stuff, what is it? It's always like when I'm looking, I do nutritional endocrinology is how nutrients, and it's not just nutrients like food, like you might think, but everything we put in and on our bodies is how we nourish the body. So that's what I think of as nutrition, the thoughts, the people you listen to, the people you hang out with. But anyway, when, when we um, look at that and someone is doing really like, well, they're meditating and they're eating well, what are you going to look at? Well, you look at the environment. You also have to look at their relationships. You have to look at the history of past trauma that's locked itself in their body and it's preventing them from healing on a cellular level. So there's a lot of things that go in and you might hear me speak and say somebody is struggling with the weight that just won't budge and they hear me speak. There may be one thing they go, oh my God, I bet it's insulin. And they do something and suddenly like they're able to do it or it's leptin or, but for others, it might be, well, I'm doing that. I'm doing what she says but it's the environment. It's mold in the environment. It could be an old chronic infection. It could be a Epstein bar. It could be a Lyme thing. So we just have to be detectives. Yeah. Our because our doctors, doctors are not being the detectives for no, us, are they? Not, not unless they go to my school and then they learn to be a detective. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I teach, but because we have to, that's what all practitioners need to do. But because we don't have that transformation happening yet, we all have to take control of our own health. Yeah, 100%. Now, what, something that you're talking about obscure things that could be underlying, something I've heard you talk about that not many people talk about is hormone resistance. Yeah. So can you explain what hormone resistance is? And I hate to throw another curveball at my audience, like, oh, great, another thing that another it could thing. be. Right? Well, the good news is that to fix it is similar to some of the other things. Oh, but good. Okay. But it's of it so that you don't go down the wrong path in trying to fix it. So um, we have on every cell our receptors and the receptors are what the allows different chemicals to bind and then make its way into the cell. So, and they're all different shapes, right? So you can only let certain chemicals in and others not in. Um, the unfortunate thing is those bad stuff, the, the, the estrogen mimickers and the, the hormone disruptors, those actually can mimic some other stuff and get in the cell. But a thyroid hormone looks different than an adrenal hormone, looks different than estrogen or progesterone or testosterone, et cetera, or any of the hundreds of other hormones there are. And they get into the cell by binding, and then there's a whole structure that happens, and the, the hormone gets pulled into the cell to do its thing. There are things that disrupt those receptors from working properly. One is chemicals in the environment, certain chemicals in the environment. Uh, dioxin is one for sure. And, you know, some of the pesticides that are used in food production, um, glyphosate, some of the things that are used on food, but also not just the chemicals, but the reactions that our body has to fats that have been exposed to high heat or processing heat, light, or air disrupt fats and turns perfectly good fats into what's called oxidized fats. 
-hmm. And those oxidized fats are basically free rad radical um, creators. They basically create these little radical molecules that go and try to stabilize and at the wake of all your tissue and you get destabilized. So it damages cell membranes. So not just from hormone receptor standpoint, but all the other things that cell membranes do, which is allow nutrients in and it allows waste out. Right, so damaged and, and, and oxidized fats are super. But here's the other thing, we just talked about stress. The hormone cortisol actually disrupts the cells in many different hormones, especially thyroid. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge yeah. interaction. And so when we have too much cortisol, it can actually damage those cell linings and doesn't allow the thyroid hormone to get in. So a lot of people are, they're going and they're getting Synthroid or they're getting Nature Throid and they're getting these thyroid medications, but not really getting don't the feel anything. Yeah. Don't feel yeah. Any different, right? Or the doctor says, oh, wow, it sounds like you have a thyroid problem. Oh, we just ran some tests and <clears throat> you don't have a thyroid problem. So here's some Prozac for the depression and here's some Maalox for the constipation and here's some of this for your dry skin and they give different pieces because they're addressing symptoms as opposed to the root cause. So hormone resistance is one of those things that it will mimic the effects of a hormone deficiency. So symptomatically, you look like you don't have enough of the hormone because you don't. You have it right. in the blood, but not in the cells. In the cell. But it also, huh, double-edged sword, it can also cause some of the damaging effects of too much hormone, right? So that there's, you in some cases, you have symptoms of a low hormone function, but your blood shows high levels of that hormone. Yeah. Why? Because it's floating around and it can't get into the cells. And a lot of the different hormones, especially insulin is one of the worst, it will cause damage to the parts that don't get resistant to it. It'll cause damage to, to various wow. blood yeah. vessel linings and things like that. So hormone resistance is often overlooked, except we talk about insulin resistance, right? That's yeah. considered the precursor to diabetes. But in reality, many people have signs of insulin resistance about 30 years before it gets diagnosed and detected by the wow. way that medicine looks at it. We, people are starting to talk about leptin resistance. And leptin is that hormone that says, hey, fat cells say, hey, I'm full. Fat cells produce it and say, hey, I'm full. Turn off the appetite. And people who are overweight are going, well, what the heck's wrong with my leptin? Because <laughs> I probably have plenty of it if it's produced by fat cells. Well, why isn't it turning off my appetite? Leptin, leptin resistance, right? The leptin resistance happens at the brain, but it also happens at the pancreas. And there's some subtle interactions between leptin and insulin. Wow. Insulin's a fat storage hormone. So there's a lot of mess that goes on there. So yeah. hormone resistance is huge. The other thing that can cause it, though, is taking exogenous hormones, taking hormones in from the outside. People, they always ask me, well, what do you think of, of um, bioidentical hormones? I'm like, they're great when you need them and when you take them in physiologic doses, meaning the dose that your body would normally produce to make up for a gland that has either been surgically removed or ablated or is damaged, right? So you make up the difference. I see people going, DHEA, that's supposed to be good for me. And they're taking like 50 to 100 milligrams of DHEA. It's like, oh my God, that's not the way the body does it. The body will give you like one, two, three milligrams at a time spread out across the day. And what happens is if you have too much of a hormone, the cells are going to protect themselves from it. And they're going to say, Oop, close down. Nope, no more. Sorry, we're done. Wow. I've heard that about... Um... In, in a lot of the thyroid forums, the recommendation is if you have uh, adrenal insufficiency, so you've got low cortisol, they say you shouldn't take just small amounts of Cortef, which is like a prescription grade cortisol, basically. They say you should be replacing it with a higher dose, like 20 to 30 milligrams a day spread out throughout the day, and you should be com trying to completely replace your own. Have you heard that before? I, I've seen people do yeah. it and people get in big trouble with it. I know. Um, well, and I did it. <laughs> I feel really stupid for doing it, but I was in a desk. I was like, exactly what you said. My, my, thy my thyroid looked amazing on my lab work. It was in the high upper third of the range, my T3. And I was so hypothyroid and felt so sick and had to start on t just straight T3. 
and I couldn't feel it. I went right up to like 80, 90 mil, uh, micrograms of T3 oh. and couldn't feel any of it. I was like, I am so resistant to thyroid. And it was the first time I really got to understand exactly what you were just talking That's about. That's a huge dose, by the way. A huge dose, yeah. yeah. And so, and then I started taking the Cortef on top of it at 25 milligrams. Of course, I got fat. My face got fat. And, yeah. You know, I felt amazing. And it got Probably the your blood sugar went cells. through the roof. My right. blood sugar, I was getting up to have to eat in the middle of the night because my blood sugar was so erratic, which was ridiculous. I was waking up starving. Oh, yeah. oh I know. Okay. Tommy, I know. Yeah, we have to not <laughs> knock with it. We have to also look at what are the implications. So yeah. high levels of cortisone or cortef, right? Or whatever, even if it's yeah. just glandular, the natural versus a corta, uh, you know, cortisone, which is the synthetic, it will cause the blood sugar to go up because it's what it does, which will cause the insulin to go up, which will cause all the negative side effects of insulin, which will cause you to gain weight, but it also affects the conversion of T4 to T3. Too much or too little. So it's, you gotta get the Goldilocks principle there just right. Too much or too little will interfere with the activation of, cord of, of um, thyroid hormone, right? in addition to affecting the, um, cells, the membrane. Right. So yeah. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. So can yeah. we reverse this um, hormone resistance, this hormone imbalance? Do you think mostly through food? Like well, I think you can do it through food um, a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, you have to look at, uh, really look at the body and, and what it's deficient in. A lot of times we do want to throw in supplements at the isolated supplements that we found to be deficient that are going to work because the food can take a little longer. But overall, you know, you have to look at the food, you have to look at the lifestyle, the exposures, the relationships, right? It's a balancing act. It's this, this whole juggling act of getting all of those pieces right. But identifying for you, you may have this beautiful childhood and you don't have any old traumas. It's none of that. Maybe it's just, you know, the trauma that you fell off a horse a couple years ago and you broke your back and you know, you were under surgeries and you had all kinds of interventions. And then we have to just find out what's out of balance in the body and restore the balance. What's the cause and restore the balance. Yeah. We're always so quick to move, myself included, obviously to the medications. And is there a place for, like you said, like the little bit of bioidentical hormone? Oh, absolutely. There's yeah. a totally a place, you know, there are people yeah. who have had their thyroid removed because they had thyroid cancer, they had it removed. There's people who've had their ovaries removed, right? And you know, you shouldn't be affected by your ovaries being removed when you're 75, because they're dysfunct they're not gonna function at all then. But that transition period, like, you know, they're 40 or 45, their body wasn't quite ready to give that up. But the other thing that people don't realize is that the ovaries produce most of the testosterone, not testosterone, that's in the males, that's the testes, but most of the progesterone and estrogen but the adrenals produce some of it. And so it's supposed to be that as we transition through menopause and the ovary production goes down, that the adrenal function takes over just enough for us to be functional with all the good stuff it does outside of fertility, but without us being like crazy up and down, up and down. But most people, by the time they hit menopause, they've stressed out their adrenals and they've got this adrenal dysfunction as well. So you have to look at all those factors. Yeah. Which will then make all those really nasty symptoms that we hear so much about the hot flashes and the weight gain. It's not normal. It's not normal. And we've, normal. we've, we've it's normalized true. it. We've normalized it. I didn't, ha I don't even know what a hot flash feels like. No. I never had a single hot flash. I never woke up in nights. The only time I ever woke up in night sweats is when I was used to fast, um, well, now I fast and it's no problem. But when I was first starting to do more fasting, by my third day, my toxins were flowing and I was just drenched. I would wake up drenched. And it was always on that third day, their third morning, never before, never after. I'm like, oh, that's probably what people feel like when they go through menopause. Yeek. Not fun, right? But I always would tell people, I, I tend to like, I like to be warm. I just yeah. like to sweat. I'm weird. So I'd like, bring on a hot flash. I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like one right now because the air conditioning's on way too high for me, you know? So, but people said, no, 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 you, you don't understand. It's not just like being warm, like you're out in the sun at the beach. It's different. I'm like, okay, I believe you. Yeah. But I've never had that. My transition to menopause was the periods got further apart, then they got closer together, further apart, closer. And then they just, until I went a year without one. And then even after a year without one, one came back a year later. No. But it was oh. kind of fast and I'm like, 
oh no, did I clean myself out enough that, oh, but that was it, you know? <laughs> it was the last little push. It was the last right? little, like, okay, we found a little uh, extra stuff here. Let's push yeah. it out. <laughs> did you take any bioidenticals or anything during your... During Why would I if I never had a symptom? I know. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't need it. I, I, you know, I'm long, be, long behind me and... No. Yeah. So how do you, can I ask how you're, what you eat? Like what, what kind of, do you, do you follow a specific diet or are you just kind of? I eat real food. Yeah. All the time. I don't eat crap. I don't eat processed stuff. I don't eat sugar. I don't eat grains really. Um, occasionally I might have a bite of quinoa and vegetables or something, but I generally don't do grains. Um, I eat real, I eat lots and lots of vegetables. Yeah. Um, low glycemic fruits, um, nuts, seeds, avocados, uh, coconut, olives, high fat kind of plant foods, but whole food plant based fats. I don't do oil. Um, I, I eat like, and I eat amazingly and I get full and I love it. And then I'm done. Yeah. And you didn't, for those of you listening to this podcast, just head over to the video cast and just look at this woman. She's gorgeous. <laughs> She's aged so well. We'll all be very grateful if we can look like her when we get through menopause. We can carry menopause, right? Yeah. 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 So um, are yeah. there things that you incorporate every day that you would suggest for others to incorporate on yeah, a lots of greens. Um, yeah. I always drink a green smoothie and my green smoothies are savory green smoothies, not sweet. So we put some avocado or some coconut or something to give it some fat and substance. And then lots and lots of green leafy vegetables and sprouts, always sprouts. Um, we put maybe, maybe a tomato or something else like that. That's more juicy. Um, always ginger and turmeric and things like that. They're that going to, you know, give us the umph. Sometimes I may want Italian and I'll dump some basil and oregano in there. And sometimes I may want a Thai smoothie and I'll dump some Thai seasonings in there. So I eat, a, I drink a lot of vegetables. I like to start my day with a drink. I usually don't start my day till I don't start eating until about noon, okay. but that's new. That's relatively new within the last couple of years. I'm experimenting with that. Um, yeah. And like, I may have a huge salad in the winter time. I'll have more of a like steamed vegetables, but I always have it with a salad, but you know, I want something warm when it gets to be winter, you know, once it gets below 60 degrees around, me, yeah. <laughs> it gets cold. <laughs> So I'll, I'll, I'll like steam up a pot of cruciferous vegetables um, and then I, I throw them in the blender and I blend it and I put in some of my favorite seasonings and make a creamy soup. That's one of my favorite winter meals. Yeah. In the summer, the thought of eating that is like, no, because it gets you warm really quickly. I'm like, no, thank you. Um, my lunch today was um, an avocado cut in half and I put sprinkled on a, it's like a, a nut based Parmesan type cheese. It's made with walnuts and uh, hemp seeds, a little nutritional yeast, cayenne, Chipotle and I just sprinkled it on there and had it with a little piece of bell pepper. Very filling, very delicious. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes my, my lunch will be a bowl of sauerkraut or kimchi and I'll put some avocado on there, maybe some sprouted walnuts and hemp seeds and um, olives. I, you know, just wow. very from day yeah, to day. That sounds delicious, except I'd want meat on top of it all. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not really set on one way of eating for, like you're a believer that people kind of need to find what we'll have to find what they what's right yeah. for them this is love. right for me yeah this is right for me and so other people it's like too many greens maybe they have an oxalate sensitivity too much sauerkraut maybe they have a um, histamine sensitivity which i believe all of those when you have those sensitivities it's really the sign of a dysfunctional gut and we have yeah. to clean up your gut but in the meantime we have to avoid these things. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your take then on the fasting? Cause I know that you do, you are avid faster. You do intermittent fasting clearly every day. Um, and you've done some more, you know, extended fasts. Mm -hmm. So what is the impact of the fasting on our hormones? Because there is a lot of like, you know, fear around if you've got a thyroid issue or if you've got an adrenal issue that maybe yeah. fasting is not the best. Yeah. It depends. I mean, some people are, do great with it. I first fasted when I was in my twenties and I was going through adrenal fatigue and thyroid issues and gut issues and all. And I, you know, there was not a lot of information about it and people weren't talking about it on podcasts because podcasts didn't exist. It was in the eighties. <laughs> and I basically did a 28 day water fast, which I never, I really didn't tell many people about because they would think I'm nuts. Now yeah. fasting is out in the open. I, I can come out of the closet as being a faster and that changed my life completely. 
completely gave me back my life. I now do like a five day fast every couple of months, just five days. <clears throat> and then I'll do um, uh, intermittent fasting, which might entail maybe one day a week or one day every couple of weeks where I go 24 hours without food. Or it may be just that I, I don't eat until noon or two, depending on the day and how I feel and what activity I've done the day before. You know, I'm not rigid about it. Yeah. And today, my first, I started my first meal at 11.15. Yeah. You know, it was before noon, but I had had my last meal, I think, at six o'clock. So it was still a, a fast. I think everybody yeah. should fast for 12 hours between um, dinner and breakfast. Everybody, really. And if you can't, then that's a sign that there's a disruption. If you can't because your blood sugar dips, it means you're probably making too much insulin. We have to look yeah. at why are you making too much insulin and what adaptations can we make to you, to your body, to your timing, to the foods you're eating. But I guide people through metabolic resets all the time for helping them restore insulin sensitivity. When yeah. you asked before, can this be reversed with insulin? It certainly can. We have people come into our programs with fasting blood sugars close to 200, wow. which is way high. And within a month, they're down with fasting blood sugars below 100, like 80. Yeah. And you, do you use fasting with them then? Is that the, in your opinion, is that one of the fastest ways to reduce? Blood I think it's one of the fastest ways so to do it, but most yeah. people I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not in a position where I want to lead people through a fast yeah. on a group coaching program with 500 other people. I want, I'll do that with people. If I'm talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, you know, even just like this, I don't have right. to be in the same place where I can look and I can have them be, looking at a, a healthcare provider that they could go to uh, beyond a few days, right? If somebody, yeah. I led somebody through a 28 day water fast once he wanted to do it, wanted to do it. And uh, we got his doctor's buy-in to check him periodically to help him taper. Cause he was on metformin and another, he was on like three or four medications, including insulin. And by, I think the third week he was off of everything and maintaining wow. normally. So the body does heal fast. And that's an extreme measure. And, you know, when you don't take as extreme a measure, it goes slower. And some people who are in a situation where their T4 to T3 ratios are not right in the thyroid situation or their, um, their cortisol rhythm is way off. I don't like to say adrenal fatigue or adrenal no, excess. Yeah. It's, it's dysrhythmic. It's not right. Or where their insulin levels are off and nobody's checking them, unfortunately. You could probably do that like 30 years before somebody gets diagnosed with diabetes and know that they're on the way. And that's the kind of people I like to work with is to help yeah. them so they don't get the disease. Yeah. Let's talk about insulin actually, because I know that you, that's one of your specialties is insulin. And I think that a lot of people don't quite understand. Like I run a lot of programs where I help people to balance their hormones. And one of the big things is Go get yourself a blood sugar monitor, and everyone's like, "Ah, no, I don't have, I don't have that. I got, I've got my say. whole family to go get blood <laughs> sugar monitors now, and all of them are insulin resistant." <laughs> That's right, like everybody, and these aren't overweight people. No, it's like some you don't people have to they just overweight. don't get it. Yeah. yeah, no, insulin. You know, we need it, and we can't live without it. But we, um, too much of it is a bad thing. It's not like too much of more is better, right? Same thing. If some, if you give a diabetic too much insulin, they can die, right? Their, their sugar will plummet way too low and they'll die. So you got to think about that with every hormone. Too much of it can cause the adverse responses of, you know, whatever that hormone's supposed to do, it's doing too much of it. So in the case of insulin, it's clearing the blood of sugar too much. So if somebody takes too much insulin and it surpasses the resistance and it's dangerous. So we really have to watch it. And plus it has all kinds of other side effects. I mean, it affects all the other hormones. It affects sex hormone binding globulin. It affects T3 to T4 conversion. It affects, um, uh, what's the other one? It affects cortisol levels. It affects everything, right? And it affects resistance to other hormones. So we talked about the wow. reasons for hormone resistance. High levels of insulin will cause resistance of almost every other hormone there is. Mm -hmm. So it's really the critical one to get fixed first. Right. And, and so most people are running around, they're eating their breads and their pastas and their typical American meals and too much sugar and uh, processed food and their insulin levels are going super high. <clears throat> and after a while they go that high, the cells so nah, I'm protecting myself. And they, and they become resistant, right? And then those high levels of insulin cause all kinds of havoc. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. So if you produce too much insulin, your body cannot burn fat. 
it just puts the brakes on burning fat. Wow. You can only store it fat. Yeah. But we got to get that one under control first. Yeah. And it's Absolutely. not just, it's not even just the food we're eating. Like there's other things that affect it. There's other things that we talked about, the fat, the um, fats, the quality of the fats, people, yeah. food so, allergies, digestive issues, so many things affect it. If, if it's the fat, so like if someone's using coconut oil or olive oil to cook with, is that going to have... I think it's a, not a good thing. I'm not a big fan of oil. I'll just be right. like, yeah. you know, I'm not a big fan of oil because it's just like, who, who's a fan in the health industry of white flour? Anybody? Yeah, no. No. So why are you a fan of oil? It's the same thing. You just extract the fat out only. Same right. Take, thing. Taking it out of its whole form. Taking it out of its whole form. So you don't have the carb, you don't have the protein, you don't have any vitamins or minerals. You have pure fat. And therapeutically, I do use oil sometimes. I do use it with folks who are very thin, high metabolic rate, and gut issues where they can't really digest whole foods at this point. So we're using it to get them some calories but uh, heating it is not good. Uh, coconut and olive are probably the safer ones to heat because their heat points are a little higher, but all the polyunsaturates, their, their point is like after 110, 118, psh, oxidation happens. So we shouldn't be heating oils at all. We should not be stir frying foods <clears throat> with vegetable oil. Never. Gosh, never. never or any kind of oil for that matter we yeah. really shouldn't why don't there's all kinds of great youtube videos on how to saute without oil and it, yeah. i grew know. up with a mom who was like we weren't allowed any fat in the house so i grew up knowing how to cook without oil so we would do all our stir fries in water, in water. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's crazy yeah it's good i know it's good yeah for it's sure good. Yeah. So as, you know, as the women are aging and a lot of my listeners are in that age range of, you know, 40 to 60 who are probably really feeling the, the effects of hormonal dysfunction, what would you suggest a good place to start is? You know, first of all, create some sort of mindfulness practice in your life because the whole, the stress is huge. And I have people who eat beautifully but they're stress bunnies and they just don't get the results. So that's the first thing. And then get rid of all the food that's not real food. Just eat real food, whole fresh foods. That's a start. I mean, it's way more complicated than that. <laughs> but it's a really good, that's... But it's a great start. And I really think like don't, don't complicate it either. Like I think we're always looking for that like magic formula and it's like actually just change the way you eat. <laughs> And they eat in the way you think, right? They call it the stinking thinking, right? We got to change that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us about your book, Your Unstoppable Health. What's, what's that one all about? It's a novel, actually. Is it? Yes. It's actually a story. And my heroine is a composite of many of the clients and patients I've seen over the years. She's wow. got a lot of those problems. She's approaching 40. And, you know, starting to get the, the weight and the stress and there's so many things. And she's got all the, the um, in, still in the shrink, sh shrink, shrink wrap DVDs. And I mean, this was written a few years ago. So now we don't even have DVDs. You just stick it on your phone. But, you know, we had to make it a little dramatic. Um, so she's, and she's going through this issue um, with just everything isn't right. She can't think straight. She's got brain fog. And she has a visit from an aunt. And her aunt becomes her mentor mm -hmm. and the mentor, you know, of exposing her to things she never heard of before, taking her grocery shopping and showing her sea vegetables as an option and showing her how avocados are. No, don't be afraid of avocados just because it's fat. We don't want to be afraid of that oil over there, but don't be afraid of the avocados over here. So she takes her through this process and it's a hero's journey. So she goes up and down and, and, um, yeah, it's a fun book, and people tell me they can't put it down because great. it's a story, right? Yeah, like, yeah and it's a great way to get the message strong. across. And you get the message across. So especially even if you're already into, you know, this health movement, but you have family members who are not, it's a great read 
to just introduce them to what's possible. Wow, yes. And Dr. Henry has amazing programs on her site as well. So mm-hmm. I will put that in the show notes underneath so you guys can go check out what she has to offer because she's got, you've got a bazillion recipes and you've got cookbooks and programs. Yeah, we've got a lot of cookbooks and programs. We have programs for all the major hormonal systems. So we have an insulin resistance program, thyroid hormone, adrenal hormone, a digestive hormone, a cleanse. Um, We have a couple of new ones that are kind of shorter versions of those because those are full blown. Um, We have one called the Body Freedom Program, the Body Balance Program, where we're just taking people through a process of starting from wherever you're at and taking you to where you want to be going through this process of balancing your body. What lab tests might you need? You know, there's a whole bunch of really cool programs that we have out there. And then we have programs for health practitioners like our insulin resistance training and our digestive training and our two year nutritional endocrinology certification. So yeah. Which I need to do. I know. (sighs) When I have, when I have more time, right? (laughs) You do it at your own pace. Nobody ever Uh, finishes. I think we had one person finish it in in less than the two years, but most people take their time because they're busy, right? They've got other things. They're busy moms, they're teachers, they're, they're executives. They're people who are working in this thing and go, I want to learn more about this because I want to I want a new career path. And so they can't go through it really quickly. I had to leave my job this back in the third, in the thirties. No, I'm not, I'm not that old. (laughs) Back in the eighties, I had to leave my job and I had to just, you know, live on savings to, and take out loans to go to school to create a new career. Now you don't have to do that. No, I've taken everything I've great. learned in school on top of that, everything I've learned in 25, 27 years of practice and yeah. put it all together in a program. So. And you've got great free like little opt-ins too. I went, I, I opted in to get her hormone elixir smoothies. Yeah, yeah those are good. Amazing. I haven't tried them yet. I've got to go get the ingredients. Just did There's it, so. another one called hormone hacking breakfast menus. Ooh, I'd like that one too. Yeah, they're all really good. We can give you a link if you need them. You want to put it with the show notes. But yeah. they're just little things. And I, I do give away a lot of free stuff. But if you want to spend money, you can. That supports yeah. my, my habits, but my <laughs> organic food habit. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember when I was doing the in-person visits and I had somebody come in for their initial consultation. She had a binder about this thick, full of papers. And I said, wow, it looks like you've been doing a lot of research. And where'd you get all that stuff? And she goes, oh, it's all free on your site. She start charging for some things. I'm like, oh, <laughs> she just printed out all the free recipes uh, and all the guides. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And I'm happy that I finally got to speak with you. Yeah, I'm really happy that you invited me. Thank you. It's been thank fun. you. All right. Bye-bye.